Please. Welcome back to the next part of this Truth and Rhythm episode. Be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. Also become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you so much for your interest and support. Enjoy. I, I lived in LA for nine months during my divorce with my buddy and I lived in the rough side. I lived on Arizona Avenue in East LA by the East LA Civic Center. And that area, it wasn't gang ridden, but a lot of essential workers lived there. So it was like the house we were staying in, right behind that house is another house, right behind that house is another house, right behind that house is another house. And they all share one drive. And I had never seen nothing like that. You know, and one night I was coming back from Hollywood because I was excuse me, working in the studio with my friend Suji Hiroshi just to get out of the house, to keep a clear head. Because once a month I had to fly back to New York to go to court, you know, for the divorce. I come home one night and I get off the train because the red line runs through Hollywood. The gold line takes you from Hollywood to East L.A. And East L.A. Civic Center is next to the last stop. And the first thing that happened, it was 11.30 at night. The gang called the Maravilla get on the train. They all were yellow and black. And they all had yellow bandanas on, white and black shirts buttoned up to the top. So I, you know, immediately I knew who they were. But I'm dressed like this, you know. Um, and, and they said, Joe you know, Holmes, where you from? Because I had on all black. They go, where you from? I said, hey, man, I'm from... Man, I turned on my, my call to banks real fast. I'm, I'm from New York City, man. I'm out here visiting a buddy of mine. Man, we're really having a great time. And they all sat back and was like, yo, Holmes, you're a long way from home, man. I said, yeah, I love Los Angeles. Beautiful. And they go, all right, yeah, Holmes. See you later. And they got off at Maravilla Station. I continue on to East LA Civic Center. I get off the train. There's about 20 guys playing soccer in the high school field. It's midnight now. You got no business on the field because the gates are locked. So they were in there illegally. When I get off the train, you know how you can't cross the street until, even though there's no cars coming, you can't cross the street. And I'm standing there. And they're playing soccer. All of a sudden, before the light turned green for me, they all ran to the fence and started crawling like roaches up the fence. And I said, they're about to come and whoop my ass. I just know it's coming. So I said, I grew up in Brooklyn. I'm just going to keep walking. And, and if I get into a fight, then I'm taking two of them with me. But I don't know what's going to happen. And I started walking. And, and I just walked right through them. And I didn't have a problem. And everybody in that neighborhood would look at me strange because they knew I wasn't gangbanging. I'm wearing a regular shirt. You know, most guys is banging. They got the shirt buttoned up to the top. I didn't even know about that. I didn't know about how, like, in Santa Monica, when you go down to the pier, everybody wears white. So that way you don't know, other than tattoos, which ones are the gangbangers and which ones are not. Everybody had on a white T-shirt. And I was like, is this, like, neutral territory? You know, and I guess that's where mostly it was. Bloods and Crips is what it, mostly Bloods and Crips is what I knew from growing up out there. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's what they still have. I, Bloods and Crips, man. I didn't know about it. I didn't know about the colors. You know, and my friends were like, blue and red. Yeah. Yeah, why are you wearing red? You can't wear red down here. And I said, 
This is a shirt. I'm a New Yorker. It's a damn t-shirt. What are you talking about yet? No, 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 man, no. Can't do that. Can't do that. I was like, I was so sick of it, you know. Yeah, man. But How long were you out there? How long were you out there? I was out there nine months. Yeah, I was out there for nine months. I love L.A. I do. I love it. Um, I was going to move to uh, the two areas that I like, was Simi Valley and Agoura. I lived in Simi, I Va- Simi Valley. I lived in Simi Valley when I was four. <laughs> really? Yeah. Wow. Well, they built it up a lot down like Northridge. Um, and the house I was going to buy was on a hill. It was a beautiful house. And it was right above the Simi Valley Welcoming Center Mall. It's right above the Simi Valley Mall. So if you came out the mall and walked up the hill, you'd be up at my house. And my daughter thought we were not going to be welcome there because most of the people from most of the black people out there and Mexicans that I knew in uh, L.A. were like, yo, man, that's where all the police department, man, the racist cops was out there, the fire department. You don't want to be out there, man. You're out there without. And I, I got out there and then I get to the restaurant. I went to the bathroom to wash my hands and use the restroom. My ex-wife and my daughters were sitting there. So my daughter and they had a band playing outside all this music. So my daughter goes up to the band leader while I'm in the bathroom. Excuse me. Do you think my dad could sing? The guy goes, well, yeah, well, wait a minute. Where does your dad sing? He sings around the house most of the time, but he's okay. He can sing. The guy goes, okay, we'll call him up here. What's his name? His name is Dietrich. <laughs> what? What? I said my dad's name was Dietrich. I come out of the bathroom, Scott. Dietrich, come to the... Th- and everybody that was sitting at the bar that was in the restaurant all get up like a swarm of bees and come out into the courtyard. And I say, Marvin Gaze, what's going on with the pain? I started getting welcome cards from the real estate agent, from the police department, from everybody. They're like, man, we're so glad you're moving here. And da, 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 da. I said, they're going, this is nothing like what they said it was going to be. <laughs> it was beautiful. It was quiet. And I love coming back to Simi Valley. Because of the rock structures that lead you into the Simi Valley when you get there. Yeah, I, I remember as a kid going to Chatworth Park. Um, I don't know if you got to see that, but it's all about, it's all like big rock boulder kind of things, mm-hmm. you know. Very I have cool. a buddy that lives in Chatsworth. And he kept telling me, he said, you know, Chatsworth is a beautiful town. The, the, the only problem is people keep thinking of it as the porn capital, which it is. You know, they got the porn industry out here. But Chatworth, you can get a nice home at a low price. Sometimes because of it being the porn industry. You know what I mean? So I graduated from, I graduated from Cal State Northridge, which is very close to there. Oh, okay. I was gonna buy a house in Northridge too. Northridge, when you go into the North, it was a gated community and they had all these houses going up in hills and stuff. And we went in to see two houses, but you know, they got sold out from under us. And uh so I said, okay, well, I mean, and then my wife filed for divorce, and I was like, okay, we ain't moving to California. <laughs> yeah, where you get you got less earth, earthquakes where you are now, anyway. Oh yeah, you know. Oh you, yeah, absolutely. In Las Vegas, you're not. Gonna oh have, yeah, in Las Vegas, no, yeah. no, I don't. We don't get anything. And I've been here for a year. The only thing that I've been involved in is when they get those really bad windstorms. Yeah, from the desert, man. When that windstorm comes. It's like a hurricane in, in Florida. It's like, oh, you got to hold your car door to get in it. I felt like Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. I was like, Toto! Toto. I remember a few times walking down areas near the Strip where they had giant construction sites because they're building another casino, and it's oh. all dirt, you know, and you're around oh. all that dirt when the wind oh, yeah. picks up, man. Oh, yeah. That's no joke. Dude, I was wondering... I'm driving on the parkway, and I used to, I'm a New Yorker, so if it's not as hot a day that I think it's, you know, 100, whatever, I like to roll the windows down, get the the natural breeze. Nobody in Vegas really rolls their window down. Why don't they roll the windows down? Come to find out, they said, the dirt and the air quality from the desert. 
And 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 since I've been here, I've been getting this thing in my throat where it's like <clears throat> feel like you got a cough, but you don't. And I was asking different singers what that is, and they said it's the air here in Vegas and the atmosphere out here. It's dry, very dry. And dusty. Yeah. And dusty. And so I said, okay, now I understand. Spring Mountain Ranch is north of Sumlin. And in Spring Mountain Ranch, it's way in the desert, there was a ranch on 3,000 acres owned by Vera Krupp, the old Hollywood actress. And she had this beautiful ranch in the middle of the desert, and she built several outhouses for her staff to live in. And her manager lived in one, the people that did her clothes or cooks lived in the other. So she wasn't totally out there in the desert by herself. And she would have these lavish parties for Frank Sinatra, all the guys on the strip, Wayne Newton, whoever was in Vegas. they go to her house, party, get drunk, because you're in the middle of the desert. And what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So whoever you wind up sleeping with for the night, she didn't care because, you know, it was in the middle of the desert. And, man, I went to that house. It was amazing. It's a horse ranch now. They do tours there. And it's amazing to see how she lived. Her bathtub was huge. She had a huge bath. I've never seen a bathtub this big, but and she wasn't a really big woman. You know, it looked like a bathtub for Fat Albert or somebody. And it was made out of blue limestone. I was like, Jesus. And it was intricate. And I was like, and I didn't know she was like, uh, 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 she was a billionaire. She was an heiress. Vera Krupp. She started in a lot of the old Hollywood films. The name is familiar. Is her, yeah. is her house kind of like some of those Gold Coast houses on Long Island? Oh, yeah, it's like a ranch. It was a ranch. Yeah, beautiful ranch. And it had so many rooms in it. It was bigger on the, you know, you see a ranch, and it's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside, and you're going, wow, okay, nice. You know, you start going from room to room to room to room to room, and I was like, Jesus Christ, this was the 50s? You know, she had a changing room. She had closets where you open up the closets with double doors on both sides and there's nothing but her clothes. And it, she wore different clothes around the house during the day, one for breakfast. one. And, you know, that's that's something interesting because my friend Hubert's sister, Hubert Eve's sister, became the seamstress for Prince for three years. Hmm. And she's told us he doesn't wear the same clothes twice. I can't Never. believe it. Yeah, it's crazy. He, he was so little. They could make, he could whip up an outfit for him quick. He'd wear one set of clothes for breakfast, another one for lunch, third one for dinner. If he was going out, he wore the fourth one. After he finished wearing those four clothes, they had to take him to a warehouse across the street in storage. And that's what happened to all his clothes, all the years he was. Aretha Franklin was kind of the same way. And it's funny, if you look at Aretha's last premiere performance, I mean, her last performance at the White House, she could barely see. But if you look at the one where she did the tribute to Carol King, she did what she does is standard. Aretha didn't trust promoters, so she would carry her money in her purse and put the purse underneath the piano. Hmm. And that's how she pay everybody. So when she did the Carol King tribute, she came out with her little diamond purse and sat the purse down under the piano. And Carol King is freaking out. She's like, oh, God, Aretha. And she said, and she played the piano. And Aretha hasn't played in years. And she still can play. She went, but I don't look at that on the morning rain. Oh, man. It was over from that point. Barack Obama, Michelle Obama, they started crying. Mm -hmm. He just couldn't hold it back. He was bawling, you know? So, you know, we have our heroes in our legacy. Elton John, that's one I want to meet. Before he leaves this world, I got to meet him. I love him. I love his music. I grew up on Benny and the Jets. You know? <laughs> that song yeah. changed my world musically as a songwriter. Todd Rundgren is another one I definitely want to meet. Did you I'm really good friends with Archie Bell from Archie Bell's and the Drells. That's so cool. I got one of my historians under lock and key. <laughs> Did you ever get to meet Stevie Winter? Never got to meet Stevie. I've done interviews at his radio station, though, because he owns that radio KGLH. station. KGLH. KGLH out there. I've been there 
Uh, and I've done several times, I've done interviews with him, um, but never met the man himself. Did, when you were on that thing in George Clinton, did you see any like craziness with the uh, P Funk? Oh, craziness is what you always saw because it was the opening act, the headline act was D Train, the Bar Oh, yeah. And then Parliament was the headline. There were 40 people in Parliament, Funkadelic. Now, back in the days when bands were on stage, you had risers behind them. The girls that they were going to sleep with for the night sat on the riser. The ones that were pregnant sat behind the stage. And the wives stayed on the tour bus. I never saw nothing like that in my life, Scott. I was like, what the? I mean, and that's what they did. They were wild. You know, the barcades. Other than James Alexander, the rest of those guys, you know, they was into tooting and snooting and all of that stuff. And that was the first time I'd ever seen two men in a stall, standing in a stall together. I'm like, what in the world? You know, and the first thing, the kids from Brooklyn, you know, I'm 20 something years old. I'm like, okay, they're both standing, both of their feet are facing each other. What in the world are they doing? And then they, they yelled out to me, yo, D Trent, you want some of this, man? Yo, man, you want some of this? I said, whatever it is, no, I'm good. <laughs> I'll have a beer. <laughs> and that was it, man. I didn't know they were in there doing cocaine, but, you know, that's that's the lifestyle that it was. You know, the band went in the bathroom, got in the stalls, and did cocaine together. Um, it's unfortunate it took a lot of their lives later on because it causes health problems. But thank God, you know, those of us that are still here, George Clinton. The wildest he's still doing it, man. He, he's, he's, still still here. he's still here. You know, yeah. so God bless his heart. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 80 years old, still doing it. Yeah. That's another one. I, You know, I met him, but George's brain is like Sly Stone. It's fried. It's, <laughs> it's fried, died, and made to the side. You'd be like, hey, George, do you remember? No, man. I remember that. What are you talking about? Did, did you? Did you? Did you? Say that again. Did you ever meet Sly? <laughs> Never worked with Sly. Yeah. I recorded his song that I was going to put on 701 Franklin Avenue. Thank you for letting me be myself again. And I'm going to record that. I've already recorded it on 12 track. I'm going to do it again live and record it. Yeah. Wow. Uh, was there anyone from that uh, back then that their performance like inspired you or just Blue oh, away. absolutely. Um, the Temptations, I saw them at the Apollo Theater. Um, the Five Stair Steps and Cubic at the Apollo Theater, because all of my musical beginnings started at the Apollo Theater. My father would take me there Wednesday night, which was amateur night. And then he would take me there for Saturday night, because um, my father wanted me to sing at the Apollo. My mother wasn't having it because she was a church woman. She said, they will not steal his soul. Jesus' name. <laughs> I said, okay. So my father told her, he said, well, okay, he's yours on Sunday because you're going to keep him in church all day. Saturday night, he's mine. So Saturday, my father would take us to the shows. We'd get hot dogs or whatever at the hot dog stands out front and a soda. Then we'd go inside the Apollo because back then you didn't eat in the Apollo. And they showed two matinees. They showed a, a cartoon movie for the kids. And then they showed a two-hour um, movie. And I, I saw The Honeymoon Killers, which I shouldn't have seen. But I saw The Honeymoon Killers at the Apollo Theater. And it was a scary movie. So my father had to take me back outside until the show started. And then I came back in for that. But uh, that was my first time seeing The Five Stair Steps. Black Ivory, the Delphonics. Black Ivory, um, it's funny you should admit, I got uh, Leroy Burgess is on, uh, coming on this show next week from Black tell Ivory. Tell Leroy I said hello. His little brother loves him to death. Um, you know, I know him as Stuart and, and all of them. And, you know, we worked together a few times. So, you know, um, and those are two, the guys. It's, it's weird when you get older. It's like when I was a kid, when I'm 10 years old, I'm watching you. Maybe you were 18 years old on stage of Black Ivory with your big afro back then. And I'm like, 
you know, we idolized you guys. And now you sitting up here hanging out with us, and, you know, talking and chopping it up. Yeah, I love Leroy. Him and Stuart Bascom and, and all of them. Yeah. Wow. What what uh, track, one or two tracks in, in the whole catalog would be your favorites or that you're most proud of or, you know? You know, the honest truth, I think Keep On would definitely be one because it reached out to all of, you know, even though You're the One for Me is the big hit, Keep On with Sky is the Limit and you know that you keep on. A lot of people were at the end of their rope. I know two people that were getting ready to commit suicide. And Keep On came on the radio. And they turned around and they didn't they didn't do it. And they sent in letters letting me know I was getting ready to take my life because everything in my life had turned sideways. So Keep On stopped me from taking my life. That was powerful, as well as the guys in prison who was never getting out. That song, and then the other one that I'm most proud of, which is a B-side, is Thank You, Heavenly Father, from the third album, Something's On Your Mind. Um, we did Thank You, Heavenly Father, to tap into reggae, because Bob Marley had just passed away. So we did Thank You, Heavenly Father, and sent the entire album to his wife, Rita Marley, in Jamaica. And when you listen to it, you hear Hubert as a genius because he made the keyboards turn into like all of those drums you hear in, you know, in the islands, the pan drums. He he got a program that made the pan drums turn into those pans that they play on the, the parades and everything. It was just genius. And I think it was a cause where um, Bob Marley was so great and he still is to most people around the world, not only in Jamaica and places like that, but to do a tribute to him was an honor for me. And today, I still love that song. Out of all the songs, that and maybe You're the Reason. Um, is the, the, because when we did You're the Reason, we was trying to get into the pop market with Lionel Richie and compete with them. Like you said, compete. We were trying to compete with Lionel Richie's all night long. And truly, and all the rest of that stuff. So Hubert wrote the ballad, and we wrote the. And that was the first time I was involved in the musical side of writing uh, a song for D Train because I wrote the bridges, the the music for the bridges. And you're the reason. I know you didn't mean to leave me on. All of that stuff I wrote. Um, Hubert wrote mostly everything else in those songs. So those would be the three that I'd say I'm proud of. And uh, once I go back out on the road, if time permits and, you know, this COVID permits, I want to do those in the show. You know, I want to do a D-Train show with songs that you've heard and some that you've not heard. Like, you know, The Devil Left Hell and He Lives Up. That that was sort of a, a little bit of a flip side to it. I was going to ask you if there was one or two songs in the catalog that you wanted to mention that maybe people missed, you know, back in the day or the first time around or whatever. And you think, Hey, go back and check that out because you oh, know, yeah. I thought uh, it was going to be a love you. let me love you uh, was a really great song. We wound up giving it after we recorded it on our album to Cheryl Lynn out in LA. And she had just finished doing Toto stuff. So we gave it to her for her first debut album, which was, moderately successful. I think she might have been on GRP. So, you know, um, with Patty Austin and that, like, you know, Dave Gruzin. And they were more on jazz instead of funk. Um, and then, I, like I said, thank you, Heavenly Father. You're the Reason is a love ballad that has been sung at so many weddings around the country and around the world. People don't know D-Train for ballads. They need to listen to You're the Reason. And so those would be, you know, some of the ones that I'm most proud of. Off of, off of my last album, I'm proud of everything off of that. And I'll tell you why. Because it was for my mom. And as a musician, when I write songs, I, I write them as a consumer first. Would I buy that? Is it something that I would like to listen to? 
forget about everybody else. And not about nepotism of it being my music, but I, I'll leave the room and come back to it and I'll play something else from my iTunes library and I'll play my stuff. And it's if it's nothing else, it's interesting. I think that's what Prince found in his music. If you don't like it, cool, change the channel. But if nothing else, it's interesting. I mean, he had such a powerful life that sometimes the lines could get blurred. And I say that to mean that musically, you'd listen to some to his music on the last four albums, you go, well, Jesus Christ, where was he thinking when he did this? You know, Because it's like going into a mental institution and trying to figure out which one is sane and which one is going on and which one's got to stay for the rest of their life. It was like, you're in this world of music. And I think when you look at music as a whole, it is like that. Because I don't listen to funk music all day. I don't listen. I will, you know, I sang on Judy Collins' album. You know, and Judy Collins is so far from funk, you know. But when you have those experiences, you're right musically along those lines. And I think that when you are creative enough to write a song like a Sting, like a Peter Gabrielish, like a world song, to bring and unite people together. Yeah, I mean, some of my favorite female artists, Donna Lewis, Paula Cole, you know, that you don't hear them on the radio at all. You know, uh, Sean Colvin, she got a hit with Sonny Came Home, but Sonny left the building after she came home and never came back because you didn't hear from her no more. And I'm like, you know, the ones that I'm really, another one that I try to pattern myself after going out here and having to do it all myself would absolutely be my heroine, Annie DeFranco. Mm -hmm. Annie DeFranco with Righteous Babe Records sells 700,000 copies of albums per year because she's a premier artist amongst gay and lesbian and transgender. So most of her concerts cater to that crowd. She can do tours every year at truck stops and all around the country and Coliseum because her people are gonna come. You know, Daryl Hall is on the road. He just started up his tour with Todd Rundgren because I believe Daryl Hall patterned his vocal style and musical style, absolutely his vocal style after, Pat, after Todd Rundgren. You know, I have just about every Todd Rundgren album I've ever made. And I wanted to meet him because he's one of my, you know, one of the people that I really look up to. Him, Michael McDonald, you know, those are two. And James Ingram was one, too. Well, I wanted to just, you know, echo what you were saying, too, about, you know, having diverse tastes and diverse influences that I think, you know, the greatest works of music are often by those who have been exposed to all those different elements and they take it in and then they translate it and distill it in their own voice. But right. all that's infused into it and creates something that, you know, maybe we haven't heard before because it brings it together yeah. in a new way, but they're open to that. The channels are open, you know, not closed off and, you know, and uh, you know, like you, I've been on both sides, you know, and had my different groups and, you know, I, I am up on all the, the rock stuff, too, but the funk and the jazz, um, you know, I see the beauty in all of it and the creativity in all of it. And, uh, you know, there's gems to be found everywhere if you take the time to look. Most brilliant musicians, not in the sports or anything else, they stay in the house like Rob Mathis. He didn't go outside and play with the other kids. Like stay a ton tunnel vision on music, yeah. Yeah, tunnel vision, and he just practiced all day. His love, and now Rob is is like my big brother in the music industry. Um, he composes and writes for films like The Greatest Entertainer, starring Hugh Jackman. He did. He was the uh, composer for Sting on Broadway. He was a composer for Bruce Springsteen's movie Northern Lights. He did all the music for that movie, the orchestration arrangements for Bruce. So. And, you know, we've worked with Bruce and Sting at Christmas concerts. We backed up Bruce at the Kennedy Center on us. You know, Rob was always grabbing me like his little brother and dragging me into good situations. Like, when you know, he's been the Kennedy Center Honor um, musical director for the past maybe 15 years from 2000 to 2014. 
and or maybe 1999 to 2014. And um, about 2012, he dragged me in there. He's like, D, you want to sing backgrounds in, in a kidney center on it? And, and we would do the musical tributes to all the artists like Led Zeppelin. You know, we do the Led Zeppelin tribute, the Billy Joel tribute. If you look at that online, you'll see me singing backgrounds. So what, what that part of my career, which I'm proud of, I was able to blend. And what happens is I always place myself in a place of learning, whether it be out front, whether it be behind the scenes as a studio musician. <clears throat> I was most proud of that because you're accepted amongst the elite. Patty Austin calling me to write a song for him. That is as about elite as it gets. But then George Duke calls and says, I want to record two of your songs. And he did. And he recorded it exactly like my demos. And I was like, holy crap. And when I heard the guitar solo, I know I can play, but I'm like, he had his guitars play that solo exactly, almost verbatim the way I played it. I was like, wow, that's cool. You know, this is George Duke. What, what, track were the, what tracks were those? Uh, on George Duke's Night After Night album, the name of the songs were You Are the Only One in My Life and Children of the Night. And You Are the Only One in My Life was about being in love and having a, a steady partner. Um, children of the Night, I'm, I'm always writing songs about children of the ghetto or children in negative situations in lesser countries. And he loved Children of the Night. And so I wrote that and he recorded it. And what's odd was I wrote a song a year before that that was recorded by Carl Anderson that Quincy Jones wanted to use for the Pointer Sisters uh, called Children of a Lesser God. And um, Carl Anderson said, I don't care about the title. I want to record it. Quincy was like, it's too close to the movie. Was, so, it, Carl, was, it, was, it, was that the movie title? It was similar. Yeah, no, the name of the movie was Children of a Lesser God. And it was about yeah. blind people. But mine was about what is, I saw it through the eyes of a little kid growing up in the projects or in the ghetto whose mother is down the street selling herself so that she can get enough money to put cereal on the table. And his father's out there hustling on another corner, but not even there at all in the picture. So this kid is left to raise himself in his circumstances. Now, when you're in the hood like that, I can't even remember how many offers I got to become a drug dealer. I, it, it was just too many. And you can choose that life. It's like my friends who grew up where I went to school. I went to school out in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn, um, where most of my friends were Italian. And a lot of them were solicited by the mob. And they were like, you know what? A lot of them became wise guys. Some of them went into the construction company business. But a lot of them became wise guys. And <clears throat> you just don't hear from them anymore once that happens. Because they're either one or two places. They're either dead, in the graveyard, or in the jailhouse. That's it. You know, or in their witness protection program nowadays, because they done told on everybody. <laughs> See, you know, like Costa Nostra used to be a quiet thing, but now it's like, you know, after John Gotti went down, his boy was like, wait a minute, hold on, I'll tell. Wait, listen, over here, I killed 50 people, but wait, I just did it for John. Hold on. I mean, <laughs> Sammy the Bull Gravano, when he started telling you, know, this before the Veloci papers, you know, I mean, after the Veloci papers. But, you know, it was like they lost all their cred credibility in that underworld situation that they were in. So that was kind of their fall. Um, whereas you have other underworld entities that run this music industry. Um, does the underworld run the industry? I believe so. Because you see artists sometimes, like my thing was, it's about money. It comes down to money. And the money dictates whether your record, like even back when I was recording for Columbia and Prada, the money dictates whether or not you get put in the window of, 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 of Tower Records or Sam Goody. Or you get put in miscellaneous deep. And that wasn't just in America. That was around the world. Money dictated the time of day. With your record airplay on the radio, you had to go around the country on a promotional tour with an envelope. 
And in that envelope, you had to have forty to fifty thousand dollars because in each town you had to make a separate envelope for the program director to play your record, depending on how much they asked. And that was the law, you know, the underground law, you know. Um, and we lived through it. We survived it. But it doesn't exist anymore. Um, to me, the new pimp in the game isn't payoli, where they pay radio promoters. They have something now called radio promoters, terrestrial radio. And these guys go around saying, hey, I got a new company. I can get your record on 10 radio stations. All you got to do is pay me 20 grand. And I can get your record on this station, this station, this station. Not a total guarantee, but I'll do my best. So now the artist winds up paying them 10 grand, and then they don't hear their record. Why? Because in terrestrial radio, much like Sirius Satellite Radio, there's only 10 slots for them to play what the hierarchy in the business want them to play. Nowadays, you can pick a name, Bruno Mars, Taylor Swift, you know, Demi Lovato, um, all of those guys, Alicia Keys, maybe one new kid, um, you know. Um, so you, you see these new kids, and I'm not hating on them, but why aren't you playing Will Downing's new record? What happened to him? See, what happens is now they serve a different master. And the new God in the business is social media. Social media is the new God that you must bow down to. If your social media is correct and you have a good social media team, then you don't have to go through those channels of a radio promoter. The radio promoter comes to you. The record companies, record companies are defunct now. Who's on Columbia? Who's on Capitol? Is there a Capitol? Is there a Polydor? I don't know. Is there a GRP? No. So how do you get a Patty Austin record? Got to order it online. They, everything went to the computer age, nothing is. And then what we did, I think, and this sucks, historically, we eliminated our history in this country. We closed every record store in every town across the country. And you know this from being a DJ. When you wanted your favorite cat, you'd go sit in Tower Records and you did this for four hours, five sometimes. You lost track of time. And if they had headphones in there, forget it. Your wife would be calling you like, when are you coming home? Because we love music. And that was our, our playground. They eliminated all of that. And they got rid of the music stores. So history can't repeat itself. So now we have no tower, no virgin superstores, no Sam Goodies. You know, the most you're going to buy your songs is in some video store. Um, or at a, a, a Walmart, you know? And people go to Walmart to shop for food. They don't even looking for records in Walmart. They ain't looking for the top 10 in Walmart. They ain't even looking for your album. So we changed the dynamic of what we do as music. And what happens is these kids are lost because their history is lost. They don't know Elvis Costello. Hell, they don't even know Elvis Presley. They don't even know who the Beatles are. Kanye West comes out with a single with Paul McCartney and the kids now they go, and this is what they wrote on social media. Wow. That old white dude, he's so lucky to be singing with, with Kanye West. I said, what? What do you mean that old white, do you know who that is? And, and it's really serious because it's Paul McCartney. Okay, he's 70 years old now, but really, do you know that his money can buy and sell Kanye West 10 times over. You know, it's just sad that our history is being lost. And unless, and I'm praying to God, if, if I was a billionaire, the first thing in first order of the day is to buy Cal Records or align myself with them and bring them back on both coasts so that kids can now go to the record store and buy records. The only place where they're doing that that I see in America and I mean seriously active, is in L.A. over in Santa Monica. On Third Street Promenade, they got a record store that sells albums and tapes and all of that and CDs. And then in Boston, over there by, um, by Boston University, right across 
from Symphony Hall, where the Boston Pops plays, right on the college campus grounds there. They have a huge record store. And when I went in there, down there at Berkeley, I was like, wow, this is cool. It was like I walked back in time. Yeah. All the albums are sitting out on the, they had rows and rows of albums. They even had the blue light posters with the, <laughs> with the, with the you know, Aquarius and Virgo that light up in the dark. And that was velvet that we had as kids. I said, yes, this is what you need to yeah. study. This is it, baby. Do it. Keep doing this. You know, I was excited when I went down there and saw that. And in the corner, you know, and they had Aretha Franklin, the floor tops, you know, uh, um, Tony Bennett out front, out front in the record thing. And in the corner, they had Mary J. Blige, you know, in the 90s groups. And I'm not trying to demean them, but they were learning their history because Mary J. Blige comes from Tony Bennett. Mary J. Blige comes from James Brown. Mary J. Blige comes from. It's a lineage. It's a lineage. Yeah. That the whole that I know of in LA is Amoeba Records. That's like the only, you know. Mm. But when when Tower clo- Tower closed after I moved out uh, to North Carolina, and wow. like you said, I used to hang out there. I mean, the Tower Sunset was, you know, amazing. Yes. When, oh, when I heard God. they shut that down, I uh, I mean, I just wanted to cry. I did. I cried. I cried when they cut down Shower. When they cut, well, you know, New York had we had Tower. We had. Virgin Superstores on 45th Street. We had Sam Goodies in the mall for the families in the suburbs that couldn't get to the city. It was Sam Goodies. Um, and they had record shops for the house music DJs in the West Village. I believe it's still there on West 4th Street or either West 8th Street, where people like Jelly Bean Benitez and Louis Vega and them guys, they still go to buy their records. I don't even know if it's still there. Tell me what, if you could only have uh, five albums to listen to for the rest of your life, mm-hmm. what five might they be? And they can't be any D-trains, other people. Well, no, no, I, I could give you the five. The five I would give you is uh, Johnny Mathis. I don't know the name of the album, but it's just like What a Wonderful World. My dad used to play it all the time. The Jackson Five, I Want You Back. The Jackson Five, Maybe Tomorrow. Um, DJ Rogers, Say You Love Me. That's four, right? Yeah. And the last one I would say is, uh, oh, um, oh, God, I can't think of this group. Oh, um, um, Tears for Fears. Really? That's an interesting fifth one. Love Tears for Fears. Yeah. Um, I, I have so many, though. You know, with like, I love Yes. Um, Loners of, Owners of a Lonely Heart. You know, uh, Go West was one of my favorite groups in, from Europe and the UK. Um, with We Close Our Eyes. In fact, I got to work with Go West. Um, we were doing the OJ's album. We were singing backgrounds in the choir. And the, this was the choir. Gwen Guthrie, Evelyn Champagne King, D-Train, Will Downing, Go West, Levert, the entire group with Gerald Levert, Sean Levert, Mark Gordon. Um, oh, my God, there was somebody else I'm leaving out. I don't think Tears for Fears was there, but it was almost like one of those album sessions like We Are the World. And we were singing um, I Will Always Love You, which was written by Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones. And the OJs were doing their version of that song on that album. Keith Sweat, that's who it was, Keith Sweat. And we were the choir behind the OJs on that album. I Will Always Love You? Huh? I will always love you. That makes me think of the uh, Dolly Parton and Whitney Houston song. Yeah, I will always love you. Let me see. Keith Richards. Yep. I will always love you by Keith Richards. Keith Richards. Well, that was done. He well, anyway, been, that's an amazing gathering of, of performers for that. Sure. Oh, my God. Yeah, because, you know, right after that session, maybe a month later, we lost Gwen Guthrie. Hmm. You know, 
And, you know, sometimes I feel like the last man standing at 60 because pretty much all of my contemporary artists um, that I grew up with um, that perform with me, like Johnny Kemp, mm. uh, um, Jerome Priester from Secret Weapon, and Oliver Cheatham from London. These are my boys. We all hung out. We all did tours together in the UK. And they were also kind of like my, my drinking buddies because, you know, you go into those pubs over in England and you're staggering out, you know, you're like, hey, where's Junior? Where, did he stay in the bar? Who's he talking to? Get out. Those type of things. I have those memories with those guys. And I just, uh, I miss it. I miss it, you know. But I'm grateful that I'm still here to sing and speak about my truth. And, you know, for my, if not, if not for myself, for my grandchildren. Wow. So, James, it's been so much fun talking to you. Thank you for sharing oh, all these incredible too, stories. Don't let this you know? be the last one. Let's have some more. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, if you need drops for your show, holler at me. Wow. I appreciate that. And thank you for all the great music you've given to all of us over the years. Oh, thank you, brother. Thank you for having me, man, and keeping it alive, man. And how can people keep up with everything James D. Train Williams? Right now, we just put up my website. It's not finished, but it's the official dtrain.com. Um, and if you want to reach me on Facebook, it's dtrain is music, uh, com on Facebook. And on Instagram, it's dtrain is music. Excellent. Yeah. All right. We're going to look for that new music later this year and see Absolutely. you back out there on the road, hopefully real soon, too. All right. Take Thank you care. so much, Scott, for having me, man. I appreciate you. Appreciate you, man. You too. Stay safe. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Truth and Rhythm. A big thank you goes out to our guest as well as to you, the viewer and listener. Also, much gratitude to Pleasure for supplying the show's funky opening and closing music. As a reminder, you can always access the complete list of linked shows by episode at funkinstuff.net. I urge you to support this program and receive the extra benefits along with that by subscribing to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube and sharing it with funk, R&B, and jazz lovers, joining Truth and Rhythm's membership program at Patreon, submitting a donation at funkinstuff.net, Buying Everything is on the One, the first guide to funk book at Amazon. Shopping at the Funky Things store for cool merchandise at funkinstuff.net. And linking through funkinstuff.net for all of your Amazon purchases. In addition, if you're an artist or anyone seeking proven, results-oriented, professional marketing, PR, writing, or editing consultation or production, check out the media services section at funkinstuff.net. Also, I encourage you to drop me a line at scottg at funkinstuff.net. I love the feedback, suggestions, guest requests, appearance and sponsorship inquiries, and just talking about my favorite subject, groove-based music. For now, and as always, this is Scott Dr. GX Goldfine saying, keep on keep vibing on to the rhythm of the one.